In the Pacific in World War II, dedication. Evil's on earth again in World War II. If God allows it, we stand against him. If human nature, we're still against it. It's up to the Allies to crush Axis. In retrospect, the USS Enterprise aircraft carrier, CV-6, had but one purpose in life, which was to take the lead in demolishing the Japanese Imperial Navy in sea battles across the Pacific in World War II, with the help of her sister carriers and support ships. In Hawaii in 1971, I stood atop the crater called the Punch Bowl and toasted with wine those buried below in the National Cemetery of the Pacific, thinking that I would someday write about the Allied Navy's role in World War II, especially the aircraft carriers and the metal of the men melded to the metal of those ships. The expected battleship slugouts would never come to pass. Those days were over. Besides, we had no more battleships after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Air power was in. The USB Dauntless dive bombers were hardly stoppable. All our other aircraft were near obsolete, as had been our battleships. To the east I could see the other big crater, Diamond Head, one usually thought to be thin, per its profiled face to the beaches, but it is round inside and is also a park and a festival site. To the west I could see Pearl City and its famous harbor, where the Japanese made the gravest mistake of their lives, awakening the industrial might of a sleeping giant. To the south I could see the airport and its new reef runway. To the north, there were endless sugarcane fields and the mighty North Shore surfing waves crashing. For those displaced, especially the Chinese. From life we once drew wine, now dregs to drink, then flaunted silk, but now in tatters shrink. Such changes wisdom holds of slight account to those who stand on death's appalling brink. Omar Khayyam retransmographied. In November 1941, the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise was put on a war footing by its vigilant captain, Bull Halsley, in preparation for ferrying marine aircraft to Wake Island. All the dummy ammunition was taken away and the magazines were stocked to the brim with live shells. Halsley further declared that he would sink any Japanese ships encountered, this to the great surprise of his staff, who pointed out that war had not yet been declared with Japan. The Bull brushed them off, living up to his nickname. In late November 1941, USS Enterprise set out with the planes to deliver to Wake Island. She lost a day crossing the international date line and some of the sailors perhaps wondered where the date went. On the return trip, December 5th occurred twice and so now time had paid them back. Enterprise was due into Pearl Harbor late in the evening on December 6th, 1941. The sailors had envisioned a glorious weekend ashore, especially a big Saturday night and a peaceful Sunday to recuperate. They might find some girls in downtown Honolulu on Hotel Street, even renting them for a long time instead of the usual short time, or dance with the USO girls at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel where the pilots stayed. They could swim and surf on the last of the world's open beaches too, and hobnob with the tourists and the VIPs. Since Europe and much of Asia were closed, anyone who was anyone was in Waikiki, freed of most of their cares and worries the surf flowing in and around them on the last winter beaches in the world, at the last resort. USS Enterprise and her fleet, now just two days away from Pearl, encountered severe storms, she soon having to halve her speed. For the men of the thin tin can destroyers could not take the pounding of the tremendous waves. She was now due into Pearl late on Sunday the 8th, to the dismay of the crew. USS Enterprise couldn't see the huge Imperial Japanese naval attack fleet heading toward Pearl Harbor, nor could they be seen by it. They were as the proverbial two fleets passing in the night. But it is more that the Japanese fleet was north, and the American fleet was south, both heading east. Radar was still in its infancy, although Enterprise had a primitive version of it. Early Sunday morning on December 7, 1941, Nagumo and Admiral Yamamoto launched 384 aircraft from six aircraft carriers. The fleet carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, Soryu, and the larger supercarriers, Shikaku and Zuikaku. Enterprise fleet, due into Pearl Harbor on December 6, 1941, was delayed by storms and sneaks in on the 8th, the sinking Arizona still burning, 
She refuels and restocks in seven hours. Amid the destruction of the battleships, Halsley noting, the Japanese language will one day be spoken only in hell. Yamamoto now feels free to conquer the Pacific Islands and Australia, not realizing he'd made what would come to be his worst foe. The Grey Ghost. The Enterprise. She'd be reported sunk by Japan four times, but she dare return from the grave to haunt. The Navy had switched to its carrier base with Yorktown, Hornet, Lexington and Saratoga. Yorktown and her fleet headed for the Panama Canal, and Saratoga raced from San Diego. Lexington and Saratoga were of an earlier class from the late 1920s, sturdily built but slow to maneuver, being massive monoliths, this great size even considering the recent but now ending biplane age. Enterprise, Yorktown and Hornet were triplet sister ships of the same Yorktown class, begun in the mid-1930s, although the Hornet was still in Norfolk, awaiting her commission, and the Yorktown was just recently patrolling the Atlantic for German submarines. Hornet's crew was green, while the crews of the Enterprise and the Yorktown were old hands. After the Pearl Harbor attack, the aircraft carriers Enterprise and Lexington guarded Hawaii from further attacks for two months, which time also allowed the buildup of naval strength. But the Japs stayed away after much debate in their ranks, for they feared that their supply lines would be stretched too thin. They began planning to take Midway Island instead to seal the deal and to also consolidate their gains in the east and cut off Australia. In January 1942, Saratoga was hit by a Japanese torpedo and sailed back to San Diego for repairs. In February 1942, the Allies raided the Japanese-held Marshall Islands, then retreated the best they could do, for they couldn't stick around to suffer the Japanese armada. However, it was stunning success. Carriers have to keep on the move to avoid becoming targets. The Hornet completed her training exercises and headed for the Panama Canal, and then to San Diego to load a surprise. James Doolittle had an idea. During April, the Enterprise had long been pushing west and north at flank speed, attended by extra oil tankers. It was getting colder every day. The winter gear came out. Even the repair crews stationed deep in the Enterprise could tell that they were headed toward Japan, of all places, an uneven match ten times over. What the hell? Crazy. When the Enterprise began to slow to a halt in the middle of the ocean's nowhere, many came up to take a look. Another ship's hulk loomed through the mist as the Enterprise closed in on it. It could be a carrier as per its bottom profile, but the top profile was all wrong. Some things big and brown were there, not painted with any navy blue, and they seemed to hang over the deck. In April 1942, the aircraft carrier Enterprise strangely heed toward Japan and stopped near an odd-looking ship. It was the Hornet, and she was carrying 16 Army B-24 bombers, modified for more distance, each one having a crew of four. The ship signals flashed and both carriers were soon off toward Japan. The plan was to hit about 24 critical targets all over Japan, and then fly on to land in the parts of China not yet controlled by the Japanese. However, along the way the carriers were spotted by a Japanese patrol boat that was able to get a message out. The bombers had to launch right away, albeit still several hundred kilometers from the planned launch point. Hornet turned into the wind. James Doolittle took off first, having the least amount of deck space, 15 bombers parked right behind him. He and they had to fly off left of the center line, the left wing hanging over the left side of the carrier, to avoid the ring wing hitting the control tower, which kind of takeoff caused turbulence. Doolittle made it, followed by 15 more. The carriers and their fleets turned about and raced towards home, their boilers going full blast. The hits on Japan were as 24 Mini 9 to 11 S, but of course, Britain had survived hundreds of these during the Blitz, but the psychological damage devastated the Japanese. They hurried up their plan for the attack on Midway. Somehow, Tokyo and the rest of Japan had been bombed by 16 US Army B-24 bombers. Since the enemy was at a loss as to where they could have come from, it was leaked that they had come from the no longer so mythical Shangri-La Island, and that there were more to come, although we couldn't really pull it off again. Meanwhile, in the Battle of the Coral Sea, in May 1942, the Lexington was hit by two torpedoes and some bombs, and we damaged Zuikaku and the Suikaku. Poor Lady Lex had gone to the bottom. We had tried to tow her. Yorktown received great damage, made some repairs, and slowly headed for Pearl. Saratoga was still under repair in San Diego. The Battle of the Coral Sea had ended, 
It was kind of a draw, but the Japanese now had two less carriers available to attack Midway. We had but three operational carriers left, the Triplet Sisters, Yorktown, Hornet and Enterprise if they could make it home. Many of the Doolittle bomber pilots survived after having done much more than just a little. Admiral Chester Nimitz declared that Yorktown had to be repaired in 72 hours, for June 4th has been predicted as the date that the Japanese would attack Midway Island. We'd sent out a fake message about a water shortage on Midway. The Japanese relayed it as a water shortage on AF, AF being their code name for the next attack. The three sisters headed north and a bit west, several days ahead, well out of discovery range. Yorktown's main boiler was offline, but she ran well enough. The Japanese thought that our carriers were still near Pearl and that they could be lured out. Eight Japanese submarines approached Pearl to sink them, finding nothing. Japan had been at war since 1937, in the east, a seemingly unstoppable force on land and sea, undeniably having the best navy the world had ever known, and hadn't been much affected by what had slowed the other nations down, such as the naval treaty limiting battleships, the celebrations of the end of World War I, the continuing Spanish influenza, the partying of the Roaring Twenties, the gangster problems bred by Prohibition, the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl, and Hitler's War. The Japanese had superb torpedoes and highly trained crews, pilots and mechanics. If there was anything that the Japanese weren't good at, it was defense, for they had always been on the offensive, conquering as they pleased, never even having to worry about preparing for or putting out fires on their ships, such as replacing gasoline in the lines with CO2 when about to be attacked. As for the Allies, although we had three new carriers from the late 1930s and two from the 20s, they weren't going to be enough. Our battleships were antiquated long before the Pearl Harbor attack. Our torpedo planes, the Devastators, were much too slow and couldn't devastate anything. The Avenger class was not available until after the Battle of Midway. All the more because nine out of ten times the torpedoes didn't detonate. Our protective fighter planes, the Wildcats, although rugged, were not up to par with the speed of the Japanese Zeros. The Hellcat class was not available until after the Battle of Midway. Some of our finer ships had to remain in the Atlantic, battling German battleships and submarines. However, our dive bombers, the Dauntlesses, were peerless and would save the day. June 4, 1942 arrived. There were four Japanese carriers, Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu and Soryu. Shokaku and Zuikaku were still under repair. The US bombers on Midway had already been warming up and took off. They didn't accomplish much, the Japanese and their Zeros were too strong, but an unplanned indirect effect was in the offing and building. Three doomed squadrons of US Devastator torpedo planes took off. Of the 40, only five returned. Oddly, three of them were the number seven planes from each group, for most it was their last time together. Yet the Devastators in their sad missions had drawn the Zeros to them, and low and away from the Japanese carriers like the Midway bombers did, and to boot at the extremely low altitude that the Devastators had to fly to drop their torpedoes. Meanwhile, the USS Nautilus submarine had a run-in with the Japanese fleet, a Japanese destroyer breaking away from the fleet to deal with it, but they both finally broke off. Our dive bombers had been out looking for the main Japanese fleet, but so far could not find it, thinking it to be still heading for Midway. Chief McCluskey and his air groups might have to return, for their gas tanks were nearing their midpoints. Japan's four carriers had turned west and were now heading toward the US carrier's newly suspected position, which was correct. The Japanese were thus changing their ordnance from land to sea type. McCluskey decided to head north, dam the gas tanks, they might still make it, and if not, they could ditch near to Allied ships and get new planes. Saratoga was indeed racing from San Diego with a shipload of new planes, however she was still several days away. 1942, in the Pacific. Then. McCluskey's dive bombers spotted the lone Japanese destroyer that had engaged the Nautilus and overtook it, not stopping but overflying it, in its forward direction, hoping to find the Japanese fleet, which they did, sinking three carriers via dive bombers and a submarine. The fourth one, the Hiryu, not yet being there, catching Nagumo with no zeros about, at least not at high altitude, and caught the carriers in the midst of switching their ordnance from land to ship type. They were a powder keg waiting to explode. 
Now the dive bombers really had to depart. The fourth Japanese carrier, the Hiryu, was still out there somewhere, unable to land but a few zeros. Most of Japan's greatest pilots now had nowhere to land. The Hiryu was finally able to launch its planes with ship-type ordnance toward the now figured location of the Three Sisters. Enterprise was luckily under a rain cloud and the Hornet was further west. If this is our last time together, the Yorktown was in the sun, out front, ten miles west, and took the brunt of the Japanese attack. Her deck was damaged. Yorktown's planes landed on Hornet and Enterprise. The Japanese reported the Yorktown sunk. Yorktown repaired her deck in record time. A second Japanese wave found the Yorktown again, thinking her to be the Enterprise or the Hornet, her deck having no hole in it. Yorktown was again greatly damaged, and so the Japanese reported that both the Enterprise and the Hornet had been sunk, grey ghosts in the making. Yorktown drifted for 50 miles. We had tried to tow her, and later a repair ship drew alongside, but soon a Japanese submarine torpedoed both ships. Oldest sister down, to the bottom of the ocean, our dive bombers, some from the Yorktown, then sunk the Hiryu. Now all the Zeros were doomed to their ocean graves. Yamamoto and Nagumo ran. The battle was over. Saratoga arrived with the replacement planes. Scene script, 1942 in the Pacific. We would take the war to the Japanese. We would soon have the new Avenger-type torpedo bombers and the new Hellcat fighters. The USS Wasp, CV-7, was recalled from the Atlantic and headed for the Panama Canal. She was a reduced in tonnage version, the Yorktown, necessitated by the overall sea tonnage limitation of the Naval Treaty. She was slow, small, and had no armor or torpedo protection. She was as an adopted orphan sister, replacing the Yorktown. Only six months had passed from the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the next two months were peaceful, as both sides were regrouping. In the battles of the Eastern Solomons, Guadalcanal and Santa Cruz, Enterprise took great damage several times over as she had to remain tethered to the area for several months. The Japanese had taken Guadalcanal and had built an airstrip which we called Henderson Field, but soon our Marines had taken it back from the Japanese and were trying to hold it. Meanwhile, the Japanese carriers Shokaku and Zuikaku were back and would have their say, along with the carrier Junio and more assorted carriers. The Allies had been lucky at Midway, but now they were greatly outnumbered. Allied Admiral Nimitz knew what Yamamoto was up to and sent Wasp and Hornet to join Enterprise in Saratoga, but the score was still four against seven. Japan sent Junio out into the clear ahead of its other carriers to draw the Allies into kind of a trap to thin out the air cover over the U.S. carriers. However, Junio was sunk quickly by two bombs from just two planes, but still, it was nearly too late to recall the rest of the bombers. 1942 in the Pacific. Enterprise's whereabouts was known by the whole Japanese Empire and so wave of Japanese Bettys attacked, but were fought off by Allied planes. Japanese Val dive bombers made two hits in a row on the Enterprise, and a third bomb narrowly missed but punched a hole in the hull beneath the waterline. Each of the two direct hits sent the Enterprise up and down a foot and a half or so. Much could be said here about the deaths, the wounded, the work of the fire and repair crews, and more. The hull was patched with mattresses pressed against it from the inside. A second Japanese wave of Val dive bombers was fought off by ships and planes, but there were more waves to come, the first of which were torpedo bombers called Kates. Enterprise dodged 12 torpedoes that day, heaving with the deft maneuvering of right and left full rudders. Those topside had to hold on. Enterprise's rudder got stuck 35 degrees right from the damage and so she circled helplessly for an hour, with the breakdown signal flag flying until someone could last in the 150 degrees heat in the boiler room after two aborted tries to switch to the backup steering assembly. Enterprise patched her deck and landed some of her planes. The last wave of Betty bombers came to finish off the Enterprise, but they couldn't find her some 50 miles south where she ought to be by now, had it not been for the rudder getting stuck. The Japanese reported the Enterprise sunk yet again. Enterprise raced back toward Espirito Santo with the last of her planes finding her better than the Japanese couldn't, and landing. The Enterprise's damage was too great for local repair, so she headed for two months at Pearl Harbor. 1942, in the Pacific, Saratoga got torpedoed again but survived and went in for repairs. Japan reported the Saratoga sunk. Wasp took three torpedoes and went down. 
Hornet was now the only operational carrier left and was a prime target. However, the stingers of the Hornet opened the Shikaku stem to stern like a sardine can. Skokaku was a goner. Only Zuikaku was left from the six carriers that had attacked Pearl Harbor. Enterprise returned two weeks later with new guns and more improvements. Many Allied ships went down near Guadalcanal in what came to be known as Iron Bottom Sound. Our new and soon to be famous battleship, the USS Washington, was not yet there, but was on the way. Youngest sister Hornet was torpedoed and eventually went to the bottom of the ocean. And so now Enterprise was the only operational carrier left. The banner went up, Enterprise versus Japan. In support of Guadalcanal, she had to remain in the area much too long and so soon the entire Japanese Empire again came to know where she was. She again took great damage and made it, somehow, to Espirito Santo for repairs. Enterprise headed back out in several weeks, with crews from the repair ship Vulcan still board, along with some CB workers, and headed to meet another Japanese attack on Guadalcanal, where the Marines were barely holding Henderson Field. Eleven Japanese transport skips were en route, each with 1,000 troops. 1942 to 1943, in the Pacific. More than half of the Japanese transports were sunk in a day. Enterprise's forward elevator was hit and got jammed. Her planes could take off, but could not come back to land, because they then could not then be taken below to the hangar deck. Enterprise planes had to land at Henderson Field, and thereby help to keep it and have a home base. Henderson Field had thus become as an unsinkable island aircraft carrier. They refueled there and sunk more of the transports, getting the rest on the beaches the next morning. 11,000 Japanese were dead, 1,000 from each transport. Our newest battleship Washington had arrived and had stated stand aside to the other Allied ships and then had quickly demolished the Japanese battleships and other ships. The Japanese had to now more than give up on Guadalcanal. Enterprise had no planes to launch and didn't need to. It seemed that the elevator had been repaired, but no one wanted to test it, for her empty deck was the only Allied deck left in the Pacific. Slowly, a few replacement planes arrived. It was now April, 1943, and a peaceful lull ensued. Enterprise spent three months at Pearl for repairs, and then three more months in Bremerton Navy Shipyard, Washington, for a major overhaul, including a torpedo blister. In November, 1943, Enterprise once again headed into the Pacific, with the New York Town and the New Lexington, along with three light carriers and eight jeep carriers and new battleships, and later, the new Hornet and the new Wasp. The so-called impregnable Japanese stronghold of Truk lay ahead, along with many more famous battles. In the Truk battle, the Japanese were astounded, especially, to see the names of five of the carriers approaching Japan, Yorktown, Hornet, Enterprise, Saratoga, and Lexington, Three were brand new but seeming as like ghost ships, and one of them was the original Grey Ghost, and the Saratoga another. The three sisters were together again, and all the names were the same as the original group that formed after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Two years later, the Enterprise again got hit bad, and took three months to get repaired in Bremington, Washington. Near 70 Japanese cities were firebombed into oblivion, and yet the Japanese still wouldn't surrender. Enterprise was near ready to get back into the action. Then two atomic bombs landed on Japan. Enterprise ferried 5,000 U.S. troops home from Europe and then returned for more. She got cheers at every port, especially New York. Germany and Japan were in shambles, to put it lightly. For a while, hell had been empty, for all the devils were on Earth, but now hell had filled up again. The USS Saratoga was finally sunk by an atomic blast test in 1946. Enterprise was eventually sent to the junkyard to be cut up. All that remained intact of her was her nameplate.